for developer um, in the Center for Biomedical Informatics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And today I was going to talk about a system that we've developed for um, the anonymization of DICOM images for use within research studies. Um, the goal for this project and, and, and is basically to take uh, images that may, or so DICOM images that may or may not have um, protected health information, also called PHI in them, clean them and then use them within de-identified studies. And the driving force behind this uh, project was another research project called AugenDB, which is a pediatric, pediatric audiology genetics database, which is, a, is available there. Um, but there's other systems out there that do do this, not necessarily in Python, but um, they do exist. But one of the main sort of centers, center forces for this is that it does have manual review. Uh, this is really a very conservative process. Leaking PHI uh, is the last thing we want to do. So the, the, this all sort of centers around the ability to organize and do review of, of large scale number of images. So a little bit of uh, background about uh, DICOM data. DICOM data, basically each image in a study is its own file and there's a hierarchy of study, series, and image. And each file contains attributes. The image is actually just an attribute, it's just an, another attribute in the, in the file, along with other attributes like metadata about the study, um, and the patient uh, often pers uh, protected health information about the patient. And there are also, um, there's many different kind of attributes, and the protected health information can be in the uh, attributes themselves, or it can be burnt into the image as part of the image, which is really the focus of the main problem behind all of this. Um, it can also be in overlays, uh, which are in separate parts of the image, but when, they're, when it's displayed to the user, it gets put on top of the image. And then also, the other problem, uh, or, or any problem with DICOM data that is out in the wild is that vendors can often misuse or ignore standard attributes, and they'll add proprietary attributes. So um, some of the obstacles it, to doing this is that DICOM itself is fairly complex. It's a very old standard. The way you would expect to do things, the way you expect things to be organized, it's, it's just really not, it's, it's not all that intuitive until you have been working with it for a while. And also, working with millions of files is technically, but more importantly, logistically difficult because we want to be able to have an audit trail for what we did here. Uh, just anonymizing the files isn't really enough. We want to be able to go back and see what happened at any given time with any given uh, run of this. And also, as I sort of alluded to, the data is messy. You can ask for um, you know, cochlear, cochlear nerve images, but wind up with uh, pictures of feet and other things. And so um, you, that's another process you have to deal with. <clears throat> so some of the practical practical considerations when you're anonymizing these files is that you can both under and over anonymize uh, images when you want them to be used downstream for research. Um, over anonymization would be if you were to remove everything except the image, for example. Um, this would, if you were to show to a researcher down, down the line, they wouldn't be able to see what the study description was. So if they were looking at, if it was an image of a cochlear nerve, for example, which is what comes up a lot in the, uh, the, the research that we've been doing, um, they wouldn't know that. It would just say it would be empty or none. And also, if you remove other metadata, you won't be able to do things like measurements. So um, often at DICOM viewer, people will, will want to do a you know, drag up, do a length membership, uh, sort of measurement or an area measurement. And um, if you take out the pixel data from a DICOM image, uh, you won't be able to do that. And then conversely, if you under-anonymize, you'll allow identified data to slip through. And you can also you know, over-restrict your criteria. So one of the solutions I've seen that people propose for uh, trying to avoid burnt in data is to remove any DICOM file that says secondary capture. And what that means is it's not directly from the modality, it's not directly from the MR machine or the CT machine, it's been, some analysis has been done on another machine. But the problem is that a lot of the images that researchers want to be looking at are secondary captures. So if you do remove all of those, you'll be losing a lot of useful information. Um, as I've mentioned, PHI can be hiding anywhere in these files. Um, and also, the relevance to a given study can be pretty difficult to determine. So summing up, some of the solution requirements, we want to allow for human review of studies. Uh, and we don't want to be emailing around, around spreadsheets, which is how we started. Uh, that gets to be a problem in many different ways. Um, 
mostly that you have a bunch of different copies of a spreadsheet and also the people uh, tend to, it's, it's impossible to distribute the work up. And also we want to have whitelist for DICOM attributes. So the DICOM standard suggests or if it basically proposes that if you want to call something anonymized, you have to remove or anonymize certain uh, fields, like the study description. And since that information can be vital towards the study, we want to have a whitelist of things that are actually allowed and remove anything that's not allowed. And importantly, this needs to be repeatable with an audit trail and it needs to be customizable. And so the solution that we have, and all of this is available online, is uh, basically three parts. There's a, there's a Django app for review, um, and there is a app called Study Centric, which is a DICOM viewer in the browser. Uh, it uses, uh, the front end client is just JavaScript, and the back end uses uh, Django and the grassroots DICOM library with Python bindings to query a PAX. And uh, finally, there's a DICOM pipeline, which is a Rufus pipeline uh, that's used to take care of the anonymization after all the review has been done. So the technologies that we use are Django, Rufus, PyDICOM, which is a great DICOM library if you ever need to do any kind of work um, with, with DICOM in Python. It makes working with files, DICOM files, very easy. Grassroots DICOM is important for um, being able to do DICOM network uh, communications. PyDICOM does not support that, so if you need to query a PAX, you need, the G, you need grassroots DICOM. Uh, we also use Ruby DICOM. The actual anonymization right now um, is it calls out to a Ruby script um, because when I first started doing this, the best anonymizer uh, that I could find was in Ruby. Um, and the library is great, but it does make this more complicated. So I have a branch out there that is removing all the dependencies on that. And finally, the sort of if you work with uh, DICOM and open source, it uses dcm 4 chi which is a uh, open source packs and dcm 4 j two uh, libraries. And so an example of how easy Python makes working with DICOM files, if you uh, want, just want to get an attribute, you basically do di you, you import PyDICOM, you read the file, and then the whole file becomes a dictionary. The pixel data is available here. We're trying to get the modality out. And the other uh, large, the other library that's a big component of this is Rufus. And I don't know if anyone's familiar with Rufus, but it's a, it's a software it's a framework for um, doing pipelines in, in uh, Python. And so it basically allows you to annotate functions and with their dependencies. So here you see that there's a setup directory, uh, setup data directory function. And the next function is annotated with uh, saying that it, it must follow that function and there are certain dependencies. So here there's no, there, there doesn't have to be a file existing before this function runs, but if this function finishes completely, it will help produce this studies to retrieve file. And from that, Rufus can just figure out exactly what you want it to do. Um, it can restart failed stages and it even it draw, I mean, it can automatically draw these uh, diagrams of dependencies here. And this is just sort of the upper right hand corner shows the two functions there. <clears throat> And so I wanted to do a quick demo of how this would all work. So hopefully I can figure out what's going on with my windows. <clears throat> so uh, we basically have an app. Oop, I guess I'm dragging this off. <clears throat> There's an application to man. <clears throat> <laughs> well, I can see it. I'll try this again. I think I see what's going on. Ah, there we go. So there's an application for reviewing um, the app. So you can assign, this, this is available out there, you can assign um, different lists to different reviewers or you can, you can write your own algorithm to choose which which files you want to be anon anonymized, or sorry, reviewed first. And so here the user can um, view a study. So this will open up a DICOM viewer and this I assure you looks a lot better when you, the window is working properly. But um, basically you can cl click on studies, review them in the browser, making sure that there's no PHI. And once that's completed, you can go back to the reviewer, mark it as reviewed, and um, Wait. 
say that it doesn't have any PHI and that it's relevant to the given project, and then submit the review. And then um, when, uh, through some sort of cron job or when you know that enough studies have been reviewed, you can run the Rufus pipeline. And so this is just goes out, and this is pulling, it does a query to see which studies have been reviewed and marked as safe, pulls those studies from uh, staging packs, runs an anonymizer on them, and then a customizable hook to see, to, to, uh, to do anything you might want to do after you do an anonymization. For example, we load, uh, we hook up these anonymized studies to an existing research database. And um, while this finishes up, uh, and the, the important part here is that this leaves a audit trail for each run that you do. So here we have the run that we just performed. And in here, you can take a look. There's a, there's a bunch of, basically, it produces a number of files. And the big one here is the overview text. And this basically shows you exactly what just happened. Um, you can know which studies you pulled, how many were, how many, um, how many files were in each study, that kind of thing. And it also produces a number of other artifacts. Uh, the from staging directory holds all the studies that are identified. There's a two production one being cut off on the screen that um, holds all the de-identified ones. Um, and this can be used to answer questions later on if there's, if they come up. Um, I think I'm just about out of time and that's all I had to present, but I, my, it's my hope that something like this could be useful to someone besides just us, so thanks. Um, I think that's, that's a tough one. I, I don't. I don't know of any particular anonymization accreditation. Um, there is in the DICOM standard uh, a part. There's an addendum to it that says if you do this, the files are supposed to be considered anonymized. Um, but I don't know of any accreditation that does do that. I can say that we try to be as conservative as possible to the point where people typically have to ask to have the things put back in. Um, and that, that's sort of the way I recommend going. Um, but I don't know of any official um, accreditation uh, for, anon for anonymizers other than the standard. So what was the uh, visualized uh, that's called study centric. It's another thing we've developed. Um, that it's basically it's a it's a JavaScript client and it calls out to a Django um, backend and it uses the grassroots DICOM um, backend or it can also use Ruby DICOM. There's two servers for it and it talks to a pack. So you, you can hook up to any packs with a WADO, with WADO support and can display the studies in the browser. Again, it's, it's separate from these are all sort of separate components that we've woven together into one pipeline. Um, we, we also use that same viewer within our research databases to view the studies. The research could view the studies in it. So. And does it use any specific JavaScript technology? Uh, yeah, it uses, well, I mean, it just uses jQuery. We use Raphael um, to be able to do some simple measurements in the browser. Um, it's a sort of fairly modern JavaScript app, but it does work and it does work. And one of the, one of the driving forces behind that was something that would work in a lot of older browsers because this is mainly being deployed in the hospital and you know we're still on IE 8 and that's that's new so um, it's it's not it's not a full featured like uh, DICOM viewer but it does work almost anywhere so thanks for having me